six. Uh, I'm going to continue our discussion on statistics. We started talking a little bit about them last week. I'm going to talk a little bit about descriptive statistics today. And your next lecture is also going to have a continuation of the descriptive statistics. I want to apologize in advance. I am having uh, incredibly harsh allergies uh, right now and allergic reactions to whatever pollens are in the air. So I'm very stuffy and uh, the Benadryl is not working. So I'm going to do my best to get this to you guys. And, uh, you know, the voice is going to sound a little funny, but we'll, we'll be okay. So let's talk about descriptive statistics. Um, these are essential tools in data analysis, and they allow us to basically summarize and present data in a meaningful way. Um, you have probably all seen uh, statistics description or just statistic descriptive statistics. Sorry, like I said, I'm stuffy in action. Um, and I just want you to pay attention to these statistics while you're looking through your research articles. Um, this is not a statistic class. We are not going to calculate statistics. I just want you to be aware of them and I want you to appreciate these type of statistics because I think they're very important in your types of sciences. And again, I am making this applicable for rehabilitation, exercise psychology, and sports psychology. So I did a lot of work um, finding data sets and creating scenarios that I think will help you better understand these things. So um, they allow us to basically analyze data and present data in a very meaningful way. And they help us understand the general trends and patterns within a data set. Um, because when we do data, uh, trend, when we look at data, trends and patterns will appear and, and they guide you to uh, answering specific questions. Um, so we're using this data to make predictions or generalizations about a large population of people. Um, and you can think about statistics, this descriptive statistics, as a snapshot. So we're looking at a large group of people, and we're trying to get a snapshot of what this group of people uh, may represent. So what are their important characteristics? Um, we're not looking at them as individuals, but we're just looking at them as a large group. So essentially, um, if we're talking about exercise psychology, and we are collecting... Uh, data on stress levels of athletes. Uh, we're looking at 100, ath 100 athletes before a competition. We're not looking at an individual per se, but we're looking at what the average stress level is of all of these individuals before a competition. So if these were all athletes, they would all provide us with information about how stressed they are prior to a competition. We would take that information and we would analyze it and we would summarize it and we would get meaningful data that would tell us what the average stress level is. So if we had 100 athletes and we wanted to figure out what the stress levels were prior to a competition, these descriptive statistics would help us summarize the average of the stress levels. So that average could be very low, that average could be medium, that average could be high. We don't know what the stress level of these individuals are until we assess it and we find out what the average and then we can basically say, okay, we have a clear picture of what the average stress level is. This is an example of, of descriptive statistics. So there will eventually be three parts to this lecture. Today, we're going to just kind of talk about the measures of central tendency. I'm sure you know what these are, or you have heard of them, or maybe you've heard of them a while back and you just kind of forget what they are, but we're going to be looking at the mean, the medium, and the mode. We're also going to talk a little bit today about range and standard deviation. Variance we will talk about uh, on the second lecture for this topic, which will be uploaded next Tuesday. Uh, and then ultimately we'll get into data distribution, which would be normal skewed, uh, distribution. So right now we're going to focus a little uh, heavily on this and a little bit of this. And then, um, as I said, for your upcoming research um, projects and your lit reviews that are coming up very soon, uh, I want you to try to find data that focuses around descriptive statistics and try to present on 
central tendencies in those data sets. Now, if you can't find them, I get it. I, I'm just trying to push you in that direction so that the lectures overlap uh, what I'm asking you to do for your lit reviews. So let's get into these central tendencies. So when we're talking about central tendencies, we're talking about the mean. And what is the mean? Well, that is the average. So if I go back to this picture here, and I look at this group of girls, and, and let's say we just select uh, five of them. And we have one, two, three, four, and five. And I said, okay, what is the age of these five young ladies here? And let's say this one is 12. Let's say this one is 12. Let's say this one is a, a tall 12. Let's say this one is 11. And this one is 10. Well, if that is the ages, I would get a mean average of that age. And I would basically understand that the mean average of this group is 11.4. So we can calculate the average of the age of these individuals, right? So that's what the mean is. It's the average. And we said that's 11.4. Well, if I move on next to the median, well, median mean, means most frequent. So what does most frequent mean? Well, if I go back to this picture and I look at the median, I need to arrange the ages in an ascending order to find the middle value. So if I did, a, I did 10, I did 11, I did 12, I did 12, and I did 12, well, the middle value here would be 12. So that would be of course, the median. So when I come to the median here, the median would be 12. And then lastly, when I would look at what the mode is, well, the mode for these individuals here, the mode would be the value that appears the most frequent. So you can see here that 12, 12, and 12 is the most frequent value. So now I have what is the most frequent. So in this case, the value that appears the most would be 12. So for this central, this central um, tendencies, we found the average age, the median, and we found what appears the most. So that would be examples of what central tendencies would be. Now, let me give you a couple more examples here just to make sure we really drive this thing home. Okay, so here I have an image of a pizza. And if we talk about what the major differences between the mean, the medium, and the mode are, I'm going to have those identified for you here in a moment. So here I say that the mean is the average of all the values in the data set. And this is calculated by adding up all the values and dividing them by the number of values. So I have an example here for you. So if we had five people's test scores, and they are 85, 90, 92, 88, and 95, then here's how we would get that mean score. We would add up all those values. Let me grab this here. And you probably already know this, so I'm just, just making sure. So we got one, two, three, four, five. We would add these five values and we would divide it by five. And we would get a mean of 90, right? So that would be the mean average. So I have this analogy here that says the mean is like sharing a pizza equally among friends. And I found this very unique pizza because the slices are all cut the exact same way, which means that we are sharing this pizza equally. And that's what the mean is. You're, you're taking the values of five people or five slices of pizza and you're dividing it to get a mean average, right? Everyone's getting equal slices. That is the average. Uh, so now if we move on to the median, now we're talking about what the middle value is in a data set. Okay. And that makes sense because we're talking about central tendencies here, right? So we're looking at the middle value. And when we do the median, we have to arrange our values in the proper order. So we have to make sure that we are arranging them in ascending or descending order, right? So here's what the median is. It's kind of like this middle value, right? And in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven. So I have equal parts here and equal parts here. So that's really easy to tell what the median is. Now, if I don't have equal parts, so if I look here, right, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven values in this uh, range of values. Here's my median, and that's easy because I have three on this side, and I have three on this side, and it's in ascending order. So what happens if I don't have an easily identifiable median? Let's say that I have uh, a number set that um, I have an even amount of values, like this one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, I kind of have two medians here. Now, in order to get a true median, I have to look at these two values that are side by side, right? I have three here. I have three here. So what do I do to find the median in this situation? Well, I take these two values, four plus five, I add them together, I divide them by two, and now I have the new median of this data set. So if we go here, we look at this example and I have some test scores. Well, we'll see that I have 85, 88, 90, 92, and 95. I have them in ascending order. Now, this one is really easy because I have odd numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five. I have five numbers, which means my median is right here in the center. And I have two on this side and two on this side. That is pretty easy. But if I have even numbers, well, let's say I have uh, six scores, right? Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, what do we have to do? Well, I have to identify the two scores that are central. And in this case, it's 90 and 92. And I do the same thing. I add them together. I divide it by two and I have 91, right? So my mean average of this data set is 91. And again, we're talking about central tendencies. Um, and if we move on, here's some analogies down here. You could take a look at these. And if I move on to mode, well, this is the value that appears the most frequently in a data set. So again, if I go back to those test scores and I have an 85, an 88, a 90, a 90, and a 95, well, the mode is 90. That is the one that appears the most. So think of the mode as what is the most popular song on a playlist, like on Spotify. What, what, is, the, what is the one song that has been played the most, the most frequently, right? Uh, throughout everyone's listening experience, there is a single song that has been played the most, that appears the most on people's playlists. And that, if you looked at uh, all of the songs that Spotify has in its, cat in its catalog, and you tried to identify the, the mode by what was played the most frequently, well, you would find that uh, Blinding Lights by The Weeknd is the song that has been played most frequently on Spotify with over 4 billion streams. So uh, these are just examples to kind of help you visualize uh, what we're talking about and what we're looking for in central tendency descriptive t statistics. I'm really struggling talking here. I really apologize. So if we want to just do a quick comparison, I have them side by side. We're just beating a dead horse. Um, I am going to give you guys a couple of practice data sets just to have you run the mean, median, mode, and range. Uh, you will not have to calculate standard deviation. Uh, this isn't a statistics class, but I just want you practicing it. I just want you getting good at it because practice makes perfection. And... Um, the more we interact with this material, the easier it becomes to identify it in the research documents that we are looking at. So let's look at this one more time with an analogy. And I have these runners here. And let's talk about the mean, the median, and the mode one more time. So if we look at, let's get a pen here. If we look at one, two, three, four, five, six, you see that we have an even, we have an even data set here. We have six individuals, right? So the mean is going to be the, it's going to be the average speed of all the runners. So let's say this runner is uh, 11 minutes per mile. This runner here is nine minutes per mile. This runner here is 10.5 per mile. This runner here is 10.0 miles per hour, and this one here is 9.90 .90 
miles per hour. Okay, so I have this data set and I have 11, 10.5, 10, 9.9, 10, and 9. Well, I would add all of these values up together. I would divide it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and I would get the average speed, right? The average speed would be available to me. If I wanted to find the median of the runner speed, well, I have uh, ascending order, right? Or in this case, it would be descending order, but I have six speeds. And in order for me to find that median, I would have to take this person's score and this person's score, and I would have to add these together and divide it by two. And that would tell me the median speed, right? If we visually look at this, we could see that these two individuals are in the middle, right? They're in the median, right? Which is very similar to the picture I showed you here, right? That would be like these two people being here. Um, now, if I wanted to look at the mode, right? What is the most common speed? Well, there really isn't a mode that is identified here because of decimal points, right? So that makes it a little hard for me to identify what is the mode. So now range and standard deviation, we're gonna talk about in a moment, but I would like to kind of define those things a little bit more. So range tells us the fastest versus the slowest times, right? So what is that range? Well, here is the fastest, here is the slowest. So we know the range is somewhere between 11 and nine, and we can get a range score, which I'll demonstrate very shortly to you. And the standard deviation tells us if everyone runs at a similar speed or if there are extreme outliers. Well, this one looks like normal standard deviation because these two are pretty close together and these two are pretty close together. So I don't really see too many outliers. Um, so I would say this looks like normal distribution. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail as well. But first, let's talk about range. So range, so let's look at the range here and I'm gonna provide some new values just to kind of make this interesting. So I have six runners and I have six different miles per hour here, right? We have one running at 11, that's the person out here, 10.9, 10.1, 10.0, 9.5, and 9. So now we have a range that we can identify the highest to the lowest value. So we know that the highest value in this case is 11. And we know that the lowest value in this case, the fastest, the faster person is 9. So if we wanted to calculate the range, we wanted to identify what the range is, it would be the highest minus the lowest. So I would go like this, and I would say 11.0 minus 9.0 equals two. So the range is two. So this would be an example of how we would identify what the range is. I have another example here to talk about range. So you can see that we have uh, seven data points and each data point has a value, so we have 12, 15, 18, 25, 32, 35, and 40. Well, if I want to identify the range, I take the highest and I minus the lowest. So in this case, I have 40 minus 12, and my range is 28. So range is really easy to identify. And again, it just provides us of the simple measure of variability in a data set, and that's gonna be important when we start talking about standard deviation and we start talking about uh, normalized data or skewed data. So just understand what it is right now. If you understand what it is, that's great. If it's been a while, I'm just kind of trying to reinforce it. And if you've never heard of it, well, now you understand what the average or the median and the mode and the frequency and the range is. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about standard deviation. So this is a measurement of how much the values in a data set deviate on average from the mean average of a data set. Um, so when we're talking about the deviation and the spreading out of numbers in a data set, there can be small standard deviations, which basically indicate that data points tend to be very close to the mean. And we can have very large standard deviations, which indicate that data points are spread out over a wider range of values. So let's 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 kind of get a, a picture of this. So here I have some pictures of runners. 
And let's say this runner is the leader right here. Well, if you look at this runner that's in the lead, you can see that these other two runners are very close. So this would be a very small standard deviation because they're all pretty close to this value right here. But if you look at this picture down here, let's say the leader is way up here. Let me get a different color. Let's say the leader is, is it's not working for some reason, the leader is way up in front. Well, you have some individuals that are close to that leader, but then you also have these individuals back here, which are way far away from that leader, which means that this is going to be a lot larger of a standard deviation. There's just so much more space or so many more values between the leader and the the outliers here, these people that are further out. So these, you can see they're very close. This would be a very close standard deviation, a very small standard deviation. That's what we love to see in uh, statistics. This here, if the leader is way up here in front of this picture and you have to think about all these other values back here, well, there's some outliers here that are way far out and this is going to alter our standard deviation and make it much, much larger. So let's take a look at some examples now. And I spent a lot of time working on these examples. Um, so this is the majority of the lecture here. And I, I did this in a way where I'm going to be focusing on your individual sciences. So I have an example here for physical therapists. So if we're talking about, oops, sorry about that. If we're talking about knee flexion improvements post-surgery. I made a scenario here. A physical therapist tracks the degrees of knee flexion improvement in degrees in a group of patients after six weeks of rehabilitation. And we have a data set here. These are the degrees of improvement. 80, 85, 90, 95, 100, 100, 105, and 110. You can see where I'm going with this. Well, if we want to get the mean, of course, we're going to add up all these values and we're going to divide them by the data sets, which is, or by the, uh, the data participants that we have, the patients, right? So we can see that we have eight of them. So we're going to divide, we're going to add these, divide them by eight, and we get 95, right? So the mean improvement is 95.6 degrees. So that would be the mean. Now, the median, we would have to order them, right? We'd have to put them in order from um, uh, ascending to descending. And because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we have a even number. We have to take two values. So in this case, we're going to take 95 and 100. So take a look right here, 95 and 100. And what do we do? Well, we add those together and we divide them by two and we get this median of 97.5. That is the median uh, degree of improvement. Now, what is our mode? The most frequent value is 100, which appears twice. So you can see it here and you can see it here. And the range is we take the highest value and the lowest value, right? So in this case, we have 110 we minus 80, and we have the range of 30 degrees. So this would be one example of how we would use this information. Now I have another one here. If we look at pain reduction scores in lower back pain and lower back pain patients, we'll see the same thing. A physical therapist collects data on pain reduction. It's a scale of one to 10 after a four week therapy program for patients with chronic lower back pain. And we see that the patient data is here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, we have an odd one. This is wonderful because it would be really easy to identify the median, right? So what do we do to find the mean of this? Well, we take all of the data sets, we, we add them together, and we divide it by nine because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine scores. So this would give us a median of 5.9. It would give us a middle value of six, right? So we go one, two, three, four. Here is our median. One, two, three, four. We got our median. That was really easy. Now the most frequent value is five and eight, which appears twice. So we have our mode, which is we have two fives. We have two eights, right? That was pretty easy. And our range, again, we take the highest, we minus the lowest, and that equals seven. So we take nine minus two, and that equals seven. So there's an example of those des descriptive statistics specifically for physical therapists. 
Now, if we want to look at exercise psychology, and we want to look at physical activity levels in children with autism. So I have a scenario here. The exercise psychologist tracks the number of minutes children play with autism, engage in physical activity per day over a week. So let's say that we have minutes per day. We have 30, 40, 35, 50, 60, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. Okay, so if we want to get that mean score, we add all of those together. We have 10 data points, so we divide it by 10. So the mean activity time is 56.5 minutes. So now when we want to find the median and we arrange these in order, we'll see that there are 60. 60 would be the median. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We know we have even numbers, so we find that median. And there it is. 60 would be the median. Um, so 60 minutes is the median time. The most frequent value is also 60, which appears twice. So this one is easy. And then the range would be 80 minutes, the highest value, minus 30, the lowest value, and we would have a range of 50 minutes. Let me give you one more for the exercise psychologist. So if we're talking about improvements in self-esteem, after an exercise program for children with physical disabilities, here is the scenario. The exercise psychologist measures the change in self-esteem on a 10-point scale for children with physical disabilities before and after an exercise program. So we can see here that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, we have an even data set. So that should be really easy to find the mean, the median, sorry. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. There is our median. The median is five points. If we want to get the mean, we add them all together. We divide it by 10 because there's 10 data points and we get a 4.8 median. Mode, well, the most frequent is five. You can see I have five, five, five here. That's an easy one. And our range is the highest minus the lowest. And you can see that equals six points. So these would be central tendencies for descriptive statistics that an exercise psychologist would use. Let me give you another example. We're looking at confidence levels after participating in a sports program. Program. So now we're looking at the sports psychologist. So a sports psychologist measures the increase in self-confidence on a scale of one to 10 in children with disabilities after completing a six week sports program. So we can see here that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten data points. The median should be easy to identify. Looks like this is it right here. We have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The median is right in the middle. If we want to find the mean, of course, you're going to take all of these scores, add them together, divide them by the ten, ten data points, and we get 6.1 points. The median is going to be six. The most frequent values are five and six and eight. So you can see here, six and eight. They're all kind of, we have a couple of them. Um, I don't know why I don't have eight here, but eight is also part of that. And the range is going to be, we're going to take nine points, the high score, multiply by three, and we get six points. Let's look at one more scenario here. And then again, this is for the sports psychologist. So the sports psychologist tracks the reduction in stress levels. Um, in children with a physical disability after participating in team sports for a month, right? So they're in team sports. We're seeing with the team sports are doing anything to impact their stress level. Well, we have how many data points? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have an even data point set. That means we're going to have to take the median here, right? We know that if we add all these up and divide them by the data points, we get a 4.4 as our mean average. The median is going to be 4.5 because that's the difference between this and this. And how do we get that? We take 4 plus 5, we divide it by 2, we get 4.5. 4.5 is the median. The mode is going to be the most frequent values. We can see 2 and 6 are the most frequent values. And the range is going to be 8 minus 1 because 8 is the highest, 1 is the lowest, and we have 7 points as our 
range. So these are just examples. And again, if you know what these are, that's great. If you forgot what these are, here's practice. If you've never seen them before, well, this should make a lot of sense. And I totally apologize. I'm struggling with these sinuses. Um, so let's get on to a couple more examples here and we are almost done. Okay, so let's just do a couple more examples of standard deviation. And again, it's not to get you to calculate. It's just to get you to understand the words that are being used in the research articles that you might be reading. So this is kind of a cool picture that helps really kind of understand what standard deviation is doing. So imagine we're looking at a group of runners, okay? And they're all at the finish line, right? So the finish line would be here. And I have this bell curve here, which is a really nice bell curve that has deviations from the center or from the finish line. So let me get a pen. We could see that this is the finish line and it is matched up here. And we can see that to the left and to the right, we have deviations from the finish line, or in this case, the mean, right? And this racer right here would be the mean. We have one, two, three, four behind her, one, two, three, three in front of her. Um, and we can see that the deviations from the mean, this middle person, are pretty equal from here to here. Right, we see some deviations here. Then you see some deviations that are a little further from the middle, right? That would be this person here. And then there's some farther deviations that are further away from the mean. And that would be her and her. So what we see is the individual in the middle here. And then we see deviations from the middle. So we see people that are below average, right? If this is the average. These racers are below average in this direction, and these racers are above average in this direction. But the standard deviation is kind of where most everybody is finishing. And you can see that right here, there is a big cluster of racers, right? And if I just kind of bring this down here, we can see a big cluster of racers, and then we have the person out here who is significantly behind and the person up here that is significantly ahead. So this would be a, 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 an example of how these racers are spatially different than the mean or the person that is in the center crossing the finish line. Now we could do the same thing with test scores. So if I have a classroom and I have everybody take a test, and that middle or, or, or the average score on the test is 80. Here is at 80%. Just ignore this down here. I just like this picture. Well, that means that there was a deviation above who scored above the average, which was 80. You had a couple of really smart kids that sc scored significantly higher than the average. And then you have the same thing that is true this way, right? But what you notice here is this is a really nice bell curve, right? This is a small standard deviation. Um, so we have differences between small and large, right? And you just have to understand that, well, I guess this one is more like this one here, but the data is is spatially, it's, it's spread out and it makes sense. Um, where this here is, uh, uh, the, the deviation is a little farther apart are closer together, right? So let's say with this one, let's say we took our top 10 students, right? We took these folks here, our top 10 students, and we made them take exams. Well, because they're all very smart and very intelligent, their deviations might not be very far apart. So we might get this tighter, small deviation. Um, but this, because it's represented an entire class, we're going to have greater deviation. And that, that data is going to be distributed um, above and below, probably equally, um, the mean here. So let, let's get into some examples, okay? So I have an example here of um, for physical therapists, and we're talking about, again, that range of flexible movements and measurement. Uh, we're measuring the degrees of deflection, and here is the data set. And with this data set, we have identified the mean, the median, the mode, the range, and the standard deviation.
So I went ahead and I calculated this and I plotted it and I got this here. So this data set is showing us how these individuals are spread across uh, in standard deviation, right? So think of those racers, right? So this is the mean. And I told you that the mean uh, of the mean joint flexibility measurement was 125 degrees. So that's the mean. And our standard deviation was 7.29. So if I look at 7.29 degrees this way, I have this arrow, and I look at 7.29 degrees this way, well, then that means that the majority of our data is in this range here, right? So we're looking at the standard deviation and it, the majority of our data is in this central area here. And that's a, that's a nice bell curve. So this means that most of the measurements are within approximately 7.29 degrees of the average, right? So most of the measurements are either 7.29 degrees this way or 7.29 degrees this way. And then you can see we have a couple of outliers here, right? We're going to have outliers, but that's just kind of showing you an example of how standard deviation works. Now, if I look at the same thing for sports psychology, we, we talked about this earlier. Uh, here's the data set. We're looking at how many throws are in a series of attempts. Here is our data set. Okay, we know that the mean is 9.375. The median is 9.5, the mode is 8 and 10, the range is 5, and the standard deviation is 1.55. So I calculated that and I made a, I made a, um, a data set for you guys. And as I said, here is the mean, right? The mean is 9.375. This is the average of the scores. And the standard deviation is 1.55. So we're going to look 1.55 in this direction. And we're going to look at 1.55 in this direction. And I kind of put some marks here to kind of show you that. And that's telling us that the average scores are right about in here. And with the standard deviation, they all kind of occupy this space. Okay. We do have some outliers again. So we have some outliers here. And we have some outliers here, but the majority of our data is in the center. Now, if we look at one more, here's something for exercise psychologists. Here's our data set. We're doing self-reported enjoyment levels after exercise. Here's our data set. We got a mean of 7.6, a median of 7.5. Got a pretty big mode here. A range of 5 and a standard deviation of about 1.63. So when we graph that or when we, we make this into a figure... Here's our mean, 7.6 right here. And we said that our standard deviation is 1.63 in each direction. So if I go 1.63 this way, and I go 1.63 this way, well, that means that most of our data is kind of in this range here, right? With our standard deviation, it's kind of all in this area here. And that makes sense because that's making most of the bell curve. You see that. And we have a couple of outliers here and a couple of outliers here, but the standard deviation is 1.63, and that's where most of our data uh, lives. So these are just examples to help you with your papers when you're reading the descriptive statistics. And like I said, if you need more help, please reach out. Uh, I have to go find some more medication because what I'm taking is not working, but I did try to power through this for you guys. So uh, I will talk to you very soon. Take care of yourselves.